And we are live. So today I'm speaking with Bahar Azmi, who is the legal director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Uh, welcome back to my podcast, Bahar. Hi, Sasha. It's good to be here. So for those who aren't familiar with you and your work, um, or maybe who haven't listened to our last podcast that we did together, could you just give a brief overview of your background and your work as a constitutional lawyer and law professor? Mm -hmm. So um, I used to teach U.S. constitutional law and now serving as the legal director of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, which is a national uh, legal and advocacy organization dedicated to the promotion of progressive social change and we work in a range of issue areas, um, including racial justice and policing, prisoners' rights, immigrants' rights, rights of LGBTQI uh, persons, uh, and uh, protecting the rights of dissenters. And we work closely with activists and, and social movements to advance their uh, political goals. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to be talking about free speech, the First Amendment, and kind of the state of free speech today. So I guess to frame this discussion, I wanted to ask you, do you um, conceptualize the First Amendment as something as as a value, as a guiding principle, or can, can we only look at it sort of in its legality, or does it also offer some kind of an ethical principle for how mm -hmm. we want our society to work? Um, great question. And so, just to be clear, when we you're talking about the First Amendment, do you mean in particular the free speech clause? Because, yeah, you know, the right of you know. Uh, free exercise of religion, the right of assembly. I guess uh, all of it, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's, a, it's an, um, an ethical and a political uh, commitment that has shaped um, the consciousness of um, public life in America and to some, in the United States and to some extent elsewhere. Um, you know, there's a way in which um, collectively, um, the First Amendment protects the right to think and speak and b believe um, independent of government interference and to develop your own um, moral and ethical consciousness. I mean, the, um, the, the first, very first clause speaks of the right to um, not be subject to the course of power of state religion. As we know, religion um, is orthodoxy, and if one chooses to be um, opt into that ortho orthodoxy, that can be a wonderful spiritual choice for someone, but to be compelled by the state is a form of uh, mind control, for lack of a better word. The next clause protects the right for someone to, um, to free exercise of religion, so to develop their own uh, religious and moral conceptions about how the world should look. Um, and then the next protects the right um, to speech, to speak um, your mind, to sort of utter in a public way outside of your own um, consciousness and try and persuade people that your version of the world is a better version of the world, to change people's minds. And um, I'm sure from every speaker's perspective to make the world uh, a better place. Um, and then the, you know, the right to petition there right after that petition your government, um, the right to sort of activate that speech and demand um, that the government take a different course of action consistent with the First Amendment's idea that um, government or constitutional government can be a place for political change. Um, if people are mobilized and have the tools and the freedom to do so. So um, very far from, I think, a, a legalistic conception, I think I would put it up alongside in terms of constitutional um, significance, cultural constitutional significance or moral significance, um, alongside the due process and equal protection guarantees of the 14th Amendment, um, both sort of radical um offer radical conceptions of what the relationship of the individual to the state um and um are sort of deeply embedded through all, all the kind of our constitutional fabric mm -hmm. 
Um, something that we hear a lot today is, you know, the, the valid argument that the First Amendment doesn't protect us from consequences of our speech. It protects us from the government sort of coming after us for our speech or for the other things he said, freedom of religion, the press, assembly. Um, but in terms of speech, you know, people are quick to remind me when I advocate for free speech that there are consequences to speech, which is, of course, true. But what, um, so, yeah, I mean, does does free speech go beyond just uh, that the government can't stop us from speaking? Yeah, I guess that goes to your question about the legal legal versus ethical um, parameters of the First Amendment. So yes, legally, it only restricts the federal and state government from uh, limiting your speech. It's protection against state coercion. Um, and so legally, it doesn't protect you from um, as you say, the consequences of um, speech, um, alienating uh, friends, losing a job. Um, there's no sort of legal protection for that kind of speech. Um, but I mean, here is maybe where um, the notions of, you know, due process and, and free speech come together. Um, um, Culturally, um, one should have the space um, to express one's opinion um, without inviting in a sort of immediate, reflexive, negative um, reaction. Um, and, uh, and ideas can be really stupid and some ideas should have consequences. I mean, there's a, um, you can't, I think, mask um, a hostile work environment that you create through your speech by claiming, you know, I have a First Amendment right to compl compliment women on their bodies. Um, um, but, you know, um, those, uh, those are sort of like reasonable outer parameters. Um, but I think in the First Amendment of like other places in the Constitution, um, what probably trying to get at is, is at a minimum tolerance for different um, political perspectives um, and a recognition, and this is embedded in, you know, the, the um, legal principles in the First Amendment, that um, um, individuals as a general matter are morally equipped to hear speech they think they disagree with um, and rather than engaging the reflex behavior to silence that speech, to engage with it, with their own arguments. Um, and that even in the, in the sort of classic First Amendment context is thought to be a healthy dynamic. This, this notion that the, you know, one of the problems with state censorship, and this, we can talk about this some more if you like, one of the, is the idea that um, free speech can create a more competent democratic citizenry um, so that you get to the truth through an exchange of ideas rather than, um, you know, a, a government preferencing one form of speech or another, or rather, that, or rather than government sort of limiting the possibility of mutual engagement on equal terms um, so that people can be persuaded or the better idea wins, or you can convince people to change their, their, their minds. So I do think there's a sort of broader um, principle that we should bring into all aspects of public life. Um, you know, maybe not Twitter, but all other aspects of public life. Where there's yeah. a, um, I mean, we can get to that. Yeah, well, you know, tech censorship is now sort of this looming threat. Um, mm -hmm. But you raised the, the issue of how opposing I mean, arguments can sort of help the truth come to light. So that's, mm. isn't that sort of the basis of our legal system, the adversarial system? And, you yeah. know, that, so yeah, talk a little bit more about that idea of mm. the, the process of debate being something that can help the truth arise. Yeah, I think that's the classic, like, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes conception of the, the First Amendment, which incidentally, was largely invented. I, mean, I don't know if people know this. This conception of the First Amendment was not 
available in 1791. It was largely invented uh, by Oliver Wendell Holmes and uh, Louis Brandeis in the sort of 1917, 1918 and continuing as they're reacting to the very repressive um, uh, espionage acts enacted by the Wilson administration to basically quell criticism of the war. Um, and as they were developing arguments around the problems with that form of state censorship of political advocacy, in these cases, criticism of the war as a sort of capitalist um, uh, crushing of the worker, urging people to not go and register for the draft, um, those kinds of things were punished through the, the federal criminal code. Um, they developed this notion that, um, there are a number of them, but I think the one most attributed to Oliver Wendell Holmes is um, we should create the space for a marketplace of ideas, a sort of commercial analogy. Um, and the idea that is most attractive is the one that will have ultimate purchase. Um, so the, rule, the role of judges is to, um, not in a totally unlimited way, he would put limits on speech that creates an imminent threat of immediate danger, but that otherwise what judges need to do is create a, a space um, where people can engage meaningfully um, and openly uh, and with the expectation that morally engaged citizenry um, that is in the habit. And there's a, there's a way in which this can be a positive self-fulfilling prophecy. If you create that space, people get into the habit of conversation, testing ideas, um, and, and a democratic, fundamentally democratic process of um, you know, footnote, because this is really somewhat under threat, a democratic process of you know, conceding when your idea doesn't win um, and trying again later through normal political channels as long as the space is open and legitimate. Um, that's you know, that's the, the, the classic, um, a classic defense of free speech that recognizes people's moral agency. And you know, the one limiting exception, you know, one limit to that is uh, incitement to violence. Um, and even that is very, very limited. Um, you can be punished for incitement basically if you're inciting someone um, to undertake um, imminent lawless action. Um, and the, the principle is basically the, the incitement is so immediate that no one has the possibility to think about the command and say this is the wrong thing. I mean, just sort of imagine a mob uh, in the South pointing to a black man and say, get him. Um, that would arguably not be protected or the classic example that, um, which obviously dates, dates him, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, screaming fire in a crowded theater um, uh, wouldn't be protected. Um, those are situations where you see scream fire in a crowded theater in 1918, people can't think, um, they're just gonna run. But in all other places, we, we should assume people have moral agency and can evaluate ideas. I think that's being tested um, these days. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, so what is that? Um, that's very limited, isn't it? I mean, that means that just because someone might think your speech is an incitement to buy, I mean, what does that then allow, I guess, that we might find objection? Does that still allow speech we might find really objectionable? Yes, oh, it allows, it allows speech advocating law, unlawful conduct. It allows you to print a publication saying, with some exceptions, saying horrific things, um, like you know what the Nazis were saying in Skokie. Um, it allows you to advocate um, for broader unlawful conduct, um, and that won't be punished unless it's, again, this is sort of immediate incitement. I mean, in theory, it protects an enormous amount. Um, look, this, is, this always has a political valence and we can sort of go deep, but, you know, I know of studies looking at the use of incitement post 9-11 against Muslims. Um, and that test was, you know, kind of expanded a little bit to capture 
you know, judges are not always as um, loyal to the test given the, whatever subjective threat is around, um, which is arguably the reason why we want to keep this exception very, very narrow consistently, um, because it will always be used to go after the politically unpopular. Um, so there are lots of instances where in the post 9-11 era, Muslims were advocating political change, avoiding the war, um, supporting Al Qaeda's critiques of the United States, um, which today are not that different than sort of leftist critiques of the United States, imperialism, um, like overt religiosity, et cetera, et cetera. And they would, you know, they were, um, convictions were upheld, even though they had a First Amendment defense. So, um, convictions of, 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 of Muslims? The, uh, what, what should have counted as a speech, but basically okay. speech supporting Al Qaeda, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that, that just, you know, that just gets the idea that the, it, it should allow an enormous amount of speech. The ex exceptions are very, very narrow. Um, um, but of just sort of observing that even those, those narrow exceptions are vulnerable when judges confront, as they always do, some political reality or some new, new threat. Um, and that's what was happening post 9-11. But it does allow the advocacy of, you know, unlawful conduct. Mm. The first time so how else is that being tested today? Oh, well, so um, if think about a marketplace of um, ideas, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely, you know, and sort of quaint metaphor. I don't know if you imagine uh, some public square, or, you know, I'm in Brooklyn, so like, a, you know, a proper farmer's market. Um, but I think you can question whether or not we have a bona fide marketplace where all voices are being, are equal. Um, so is there a bona fide marketplace when um, sort of media companies are dramatically consolidated and nationalized where there's very little support for local media and therefore um, local voices reflecting the values of an individual community rather than sort of a broad corporate model uh, and orthodoxy. I mean, I think um, not exclusively, but sort of right wing media conglomeration um, is interested in just using the power and money they have to distort messaging in a way that I think um, distorts the First Amendment um, because uh, if you are, and I'm forgetting the, the, the company that's bought up hundreds of local news channels, it's not Fox, although Fox is, has done the same as well. Um, if they have a political agenda and a ton of money to control um, a political perspective, um, where is the opportunity for, you know, a counter narrative? Now that doesn't suggest state regulation necessarily, um, but it does, um, it does suggest that the idea that, um, people can come to a debate freely and with sort of open hands and open arms with full information and evaluate information to get to a good result, I think is, is under a bit of threat. Uh, that's one example. You know, potentially another one is, this is where I mentioned Twitter, if, if not, um, if it's not distortion on the one hand through sort of corporate control of, of media, think of it as like cacophony, cacophony, I guess is how you pronounce it, uh, or like the Tower of Babel, just sort of thousands of 240 character messages um, is that, you know, the same kind of forum for uh, meaningful dialogue that that quaint old met metaphor of the marketplace has in mind, or that really informed the development of the First Amendment um, in periods, you know, when it was most robustly developed, say, for example, in the 60s? Um, yeah. And the bizarre thing is that now Twitter is... Um, 
because we're all confined to our homes there's and there's so much less real life interaction and conversations it's become so important to so many people and so many conversations it's it's bizarre oh, that's so that's why i've become addicted i hadn't really figured this out. Uh, <laughs> i don't know that's my theory the past seven months like my screen <laughs> obviously yeah what else am i gonna do yeah what do you think about twitter censoring donald trump's tweets or putting uh, a warning on them rather yeah, I, I think um, the warning is a good idea. So this, A, it's not state censorship um, to begin with. Um, B, I think like looking at this through a kind of power analysis, um, this um, Twitter is permitting everyone to use their platform subject to you know certain guidelines, um, including one of the most powerful people on earth. Um, and while I don't think they should stop him from lying, because it's um, there's a First Amendment value, and um, this became clear in the 1960s in the protection of civil rights um, activists. There's value in, in seeing a lie and evaluating it as a lie. Um, but given the way Twitter works, um, with, with like, um, and the power he has, I think a mess and, and sort of given the, the dis intention of this person and potentially ill health to distort the truth. Um, I think it's worth Twitter putting a marker for people to say that even though it's coming from an incredibly powerful person, um, you should be on notice that this might not be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so how does truth come into the to the First Amendment and freedom of speech? I know um, last time we talked, you pointed me to look at New York Times versus Sullivan, right. and that's a case with uh, that's about libel and whether or not you have to have a malicious intent to lie in order to be guilty of libel. So how does, how does the intent to tell the truth come into this? Yeah, and that's a really, really important case. New York Times versus Sullivan that emerges from the um, civil rights movement in the 60s. And as I said, a lot of uh, free speech um, law emerged in the 60s in response to Southern state repression of the civil rights movement. And I think visionary justices we're building on what Holmes and Brandeis had imagined and using the First Amendment as a way to protect that activism against basically tyrannical state power. So what happened in New York Times versus Sullivan is the New York Times took out an ad critical of an Alabama sheriff, um, you know, forgetting the, the precise particulars, for the way he responded violently to um, an attack on Martin Luther King and other civil rights workers. And the story of the, uh, of the ad, and it, and it urged people to support the civil rights movement, the ad had some inaccuracies. It was incorrect about, <coughs> you know, sort of details of the story. And so what did the sheriff do? He tried to sue the New York Times in Alabama state court under Alabama libel law, um, which makes it unlawful to publish uh, false information. Uh, and he got a multi-million dollar judgment. And this was part of a strategy of you know, Southerners to go after the civil rights movement. New York Times happened to be a corporation, so it was reasonably well funded, but the implications were massive. You can go into state court get a local jury who hates civil rights activists to um, destroy them financially. So when it reached the Supreme Court, the court had a really powerful ruling that um, it's unconstitutional to punish false speech. Um, the only, you can only punish libel if, if, if it's libel at a public figure, this is kind of important, someone who, this goes to the, the, this notion of uh, power analysis. Um, public figures get less protection because from libel because 
they have a microphone um, and they enter the fray as a public figure, they have to expect criticism. And when you expect criticism as a public figure, you have to expect that some of that criticism will be false. Um, and that's good for a democracy because you want to free up the space for public figures to be criticized. So you can't have a rule, liability rule that would punish anyone anytime they said something incorrect. You have to bear it as a public figure um, unless you can show, um, as you said, malice by a reporter, basically knowingly printing a falsehood. Like, I know I'm making this up. I know it's a lie or reckless indifference to the truth, you know, like not even doing the slightest investigation. Um, and so the decision is powerful because it reflects this, in the court's words, a profound national commitment to um, robust open exchange of ideas um, and a real expectation that public figures, the government officers, have, should expect and should be encouraged to expect public criticism. That's healthy in a democracy. Um, and then I think the idea, this, this goes back to, I think what's, what's deeply embedded in this decision as well, not as expressed as that value I just mentioned, um, is this notion we talked about before that who decides what's true or false? We should equip the public with their own capacity to debate what is true or false rather than you know, leaving it to juries. Um, that's healthy for democracy if you have rich conversation uh, and people know what to believe or what not to believe. And when I used to teach this case, like in the early 2000s, I would compare this value, which I thought was very true at the time in America, to um, uh, speech in Egypt, where my family was from. There is so little tradition of open discussion or truth telling. There's such a profound like practice of state censorship. People in Egypt, I think, didn't really know how to tell the, a lot of people the difference between truth or conspiracy. There's just no practice in having anything stick. You could not be held accountable if you, you know, said something preposterous and people produced evidence because there were falsehoods all the, all the time, often supported by the government. Um, so the idea that in a healthy democracy, you, you, know, you should equip people to make those decisions is really important. I think that's also under threat now. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because we do have the right to be wrong. I think that was something I read in the, about the case of Sullivan, that the judge said people kind of have the right to be wrong and to, to try out speaking ideas. But, um, but then, of course, like you said, it has to be balanced somehow with widespread misinformation and lack of education. Yes, yes, right. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's... Uh, the, the artifice, not the artifice, it's a, it's a beautiful conception. It's a really elegant, powerful, powerful um, conception, the, the, the Sullivan conception. I just, you know, just seeing the, the durability, consistent durability of lies and falsehoods um, is really worrying. I think that goes back to, um, you know, and I'm not um, a scholar of the media, but I think that goes back to powerful media interests that make a lot of money on uh, developing distortions. And when you have a powerful media company allied with a political figure, like affirmatively, um, that's like, you know, de facto state television. That is like Egypt. Um, you know, it's, it's true. We don't only have Fox t uh, TV or Newsmax. There are other channels, um, but this is the this is the what the decision made possible. New York Times solved is the entree of you know an authoritarian who can manipulate these institutions for ill, um, and I think that had to have been the right gamble. Then um, it's just playing out in such worrying ways. Um, the capacity to get at truth. Um, and get at fact 
when there are billion dollar industries that support political candidates who each benefit from the manufacture of lies. Yeah, definitely. And so there's sort of like a, I don't know, if it's like reverse free speech because it's, it's bad speech. I mean, <laughs> then yeah. there's this expression like that we counter bad speech with good speech. But then when power comes into play, we can't as the little people as individuals counter that kind of speech on a huge media conglomerate or something. We can't counter that with our tweets or whatever. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the conception of good speech, bad speech, you know, from as the First Amendment was developing, um, I, I think what that meant was, it was like about bad moral speech, say, like, you know, advocating for bad ideas, like the Nazis, you only counter it with, you know, more speech or good speech, or bad speech that's wrong. Um, so speech, so countering bad speech that's wrong with factual speech and overwhelming it, and countering immoral speech with moral speech and appealing to people's moral judgment to do the right thing, consistent with a you know a, a democracy. But the bad speech we have here, I think in both of those models, the bad speech assumes good faith. So the Nazi genuinely believes whatever he believes, and someone uh, who is, I don't know, touting the end of the world, genuinely believes that the end of the world is coming. Um, okay, I can prove you wrong morally or factually, but there's something s deeply cynical about this form of bad speech, which is intentionally designed to manipulate and intentionally designed not to win an argument, but to, undermine the very idea of truth. So it's, it's blowing up the paradigm of the verses, good speech, bad speech. It's, it's undertaken, and I'm talking about the president and his enablers, with the very purpose of flooding the brain with so many lies and disinformation that nobody knows what is true or not. And that has the collateral benefit for an authoritarian um, of preventing what democracies are designed to do, preventing accountability, mm -hmm. either legal accountability or political accountability. So just lie so much that people believe there's, you know, uh, he won the election, lie so much that what we know is true isn't true. And then we're just, we give up on the idea of finding the truth. That's what's so, I think, frightening about this, that I think in fairness, wasn't imagined. Um, so do we have to sort of reimagine what, how to deal, you know, how do we deal with that? Uh, well, I think, um, I, I certainly was hope, I was certainly hoping there would be greater political consequences in terms of, you know, a, a bigger political rejection of that worldview. Um, and I think the president's accumulation of votes proves that the strategy somewhat works. Um, so um, I don't know what could be done politically or, or legally. I mean, I'm still really um, worried about the way in which this, in this, you know, in this country, the sort of confluence of just the power of capitalism to control behavior, and not just what shampoo you buy anymore, but at this point, you know, um, making as much money off of politics as you were able to do off of selling hamburgers um, is really, really worrying. Um, and, um, so I, 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 you know, I don't have a kind of, um, prescription, um, I like to hope that whatever was excitable about that moment, that flirtation 
um, will sort of die on the vine and that people will appreciate sort of normal political conversations um, that the bad speakers will consistently get voted out of office. I think that's all we can hope for and work for, um, or that's the minimum we can hope for and work for. Um, and then persuade uh, people that our institutions are valuable and that our institutions, including government institutions, do best when they're trusted and work well. Mm -hmm. Now, what about sort of on the flip side? Um, there was a lot of controversy right before the election around certain other news outlets not running stories that would make Biden look bad. Um, and that caused a little bit of like a hubbub on the, in some left leftist circles, like Glenn Greenwald, you know, was really vocal about that. So yeah, what, how does that play into it? Um, I'm not really sure what's going on with Glenn. Um, I think, um, look, in, the, in these situations, I think people were being um, political and not purely legal. And maybe Glenn thinks he was being, you know, purely legal and ideological. And I think the political analysis that people were engaging in with media companies was, um, okay, you were manipulated in 2016 beyond belief. You were manipulated, New York Times. You bought hook, line, and sinker, this narrative about Hillary's emails being some sort of damn, and you had choices. You put it on the front page day after day after day. Um, and that was a mistake. And it was clear it was a mistake because you bought this kind of um, theory by Trump. I mean, it's not like, it's not equivalent at all like a birth of theory, but what if the New York Times had given more credibility to Trump's birth of theory? I mean, they have discretion, they have editorial judgment, they have, you know, a response of moral responsibility. So I think that's what people are reacting to. Um, please don't like compare, like surface all these Hunter Biden stories um, because that's what he wants you to do. And the problem with what he wants you to do is he wants to use this to destroy democracy. And so I think I understand the instinct. I mean, they're basically lobbying a powerful news organization to do better. And obviously the powerful new or news organization is powerful enough to make editorial choices. Um, so it was a bit of meta conversation about how the New York Times uses its power um, and um, um, how it uses its, its, its um, weight um, given the, the threat to democracy. Um, that doesn't, you know, maybe this is naive, that doesn't worry me that much. I mean, I think um, in, if we ever have these in a normal election, um, the reporters will do a little bit better at um, surfacing bona fide critiques of both candidates. Um, you know, and I think you saw the media learning a little bit about manipulation um, in the last days. They started doing something they didn't do in the beginning of the Trump administration, which is Trump says this, um, that turns out to be unproven. They're now, I think, and again, I'm, you know, I'm not in the business of media ethics. They're very explicitly saying Trump makes baseless claims of voter fraud. And like embedded in the, in the title, it's not like he said, but we'll prove it wrong in paragraph three. The news is he's lying. Um, and that seemed to me like an important shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to kind of bring it back to the, um, the current debate around free speech. So, you know, you'd mentioned that the civil rights movement used the First Amendment and um, to great effect for their own gains. And but now there is a huge pushback against the concept of free speech from people who are fighting for social justice. So what's going on with that? Um. I think um, 
Yes. Yeah, so I think what's going what's going on with that is a little bit like this free speech. Um, you know, particularly say from the ACLU conception was an absolutist principle um, that was, def you know, defended any speech, uh, including speech by the Nazis, because ultimately um, uh, free speech most protects the most vulnerable, um, who the state will go after. Um, I think the sort of left critique of free speech is it's been co-opted by the right um, and used, uh, and I think the left would say as almost anything would be co-opted by the powerful. Um, so this is just the sort of descriptive analysis, I think. Yeah, so they would say that, it, um, the left would say it is, it's been co-opted by the right and the powerful, for example, um, uh, rules, advanced by you know, conservative think tanks and conservative justices that permit almost unlimited spending in campaigns. So that's a First Amendment way to give powerful more sway in elections and distort democracy. This is a, it's not a democracy enhancing free speech principles and democracy destroying free speech principles in its absolutism. Um, and um, I think there's a tension also in the left between free speech and equality. Um, and, you know, it's been long there, you know, in the eighties, it was around um, kind of hate speech codes on campuses to try and limit in some way that's protective of the first amendment of like really menacing behavior, because I think the left takes seriously the concerns of um, uh, vulnerable communities, vulnerable black communities, vulnerable women um, living in a repressive, a regime that's repressive of them, um, that um, the liberty to say whatever you want is a liberty to, to, to inflict further harm. That's sort of, I think, how the left says, that's actually how it's being played out. You know, ACLU conception and our conceptions aside, in my day-to-day -day life, that's how I see free speech. Um, and uh, wait, that's how? Are yeah, you saying yeah. you, or that's? Are you? No, I'm. I'm putting myself in the, the. I think that's how the left would see free speech. Um, I don't see it as that um, binary, and I think it really came to a head around the Charlottesville march, um, and the younger generations critique of the ACLU representing um, neo-Nazis and trying to get a permit. Um, and I think um, that, that took a real sort of institutional toll on the ACLU. And I think it's not an unfair critique, um, I think for two reasons. Um, and this is certainly how my organization would see it. Um, look, th this is not representing the Nazis in Skokie in 1950 for two fundamental reasons. One, because of the work the ACLU has done forever um, and done well, the rights at issue are all really well established. You didn't need, politically, you didn't need the ACLU on the side of racists giving their institutional legitimacy to, to, to racists. Um, the ACLU should choose, and this is how my organization looks at it. We choose to, you know, um, side with most more vulnerable movements. So we'd represent the Panthers, just not the Nazis. So that's one difference from Skokie. Um, you know, any, any two bit, you know, local attorney could have represented the protesters. The law is fairly well established, in part because of the ACLU work. So why put your massive institutional legitimacy? And second, um, like this is not a marketplace. It, uh, they were coming like gripped for war and the ACLU should have been more sensitive to that and war against minority people. That was the plan. Um, and so, um, um, I think that's the perception of um, the, the left and how the First Amendment is trumping, like free speech is threatening equality. 
Hmm. And that's what they're worried about. Okay. Yeah. Um, is the, the ACLU has changed, hasn't it? Since the days of Skokie, Illinois. Well, I think they would say they haven't. I mean, I still, you know, they still side with the NRA on the second amendment. Um, institutionally, I think they still, they, they admit that, um, and I don't want to speak for them. Um, it's an amazing organization. And I think institutionally uh, at the highest level, um, they believe that they did the right thing in Charlottesville while conceding their process could have been better. Hmm. Um, I think they still support broad uh, campaign, sorry, the, the free speech right to spending and campaigns and, and oppose restrictions. Um, but I think there's some mobilization within the ACLU and new voices, younger voices, people of color who are surfacing, and women who are surfacing equality values over the sort of um, older, maybe this is what you're getting at, the sort of classic imagine ACLU commitments to free speech, anti-war speech, Fourth Amendment protections against, you know, police searches. Um, and so it is, it is changing and adapting. And they have, you know, the Constitution itself has tension. So a, an organization devoted to constitutional principles, as opposed to where we sit, devoted to progressive principles, is going to have a lot of tensions. Um, but I, but I may be missing the the call of your question and what way you think the ACLU is changing. Well, um, this is just one really specific example, but one of the ACLU attorneys, Chase Strangio, um, advocated for suppression of a book recently. Um, he oh. he, I don't know if you saw this. He tweeted. Um, so there's this there's a book called Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier. It's it's very controversial because it's about. Transi uh, gender transitioning of teenage female to male gender transitioners and the medical industry that's growing around it. So Chase Strangio tweeted um, that he believes the book should be suppressed and that he would be willing to die on that hill. Um, yeah, which obviously caused quite a controversy of its own. Okay. So yeah, where is that coming from? I, I'm not sure, and I don't want to speak for um, Chase, who I respect immensely um, for entering these really challenging spaces uh, courageously and creatively. Um, so I think, and I, you know, I haven't seen their analysis, so I'm not sure what informs it. Um, uh, based on what you say, I wouldn't agree with it. Um, I can imagine where it's coming from, but I don't want to say, because I'm sure Chase can say it far better than I can. Um, I think it's probably related to what we were talking about before, about like, like real threat, real harm, real pain um, that these books cause and a, and, a, and a way of treating some of these very personal and painful issues as a like, you know, um, they said, they said kind of controversy. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure I, um, where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's not really the best question to ask someone else where where Chase is coming from, but uh, right. yeah, I mean, um, I guess what I'm getting at is sort of the that you said they're trying to weigh equality with freedom of speech. So, do those things actually conflict in your mind with each other? I mean, the fight for equality and social justice, and then also the principle of free speech. I think that can be intention, and I'm not really coming up with a great example, but I know I've struggled with the tensions before. Um, I think, you know, masking sort of, um, um, a campaign to sort of persecute a minority community through, um, speech uh, can be a threat to the equality of those individuals. Um, uh, it can certainly be experienced as a threat. So, you know, there's a way in which 
our organization wouldn't be on the side of those threateners. Um, not that we'd argue against the like baseline First Amendment principles. We just wouldn't put our, our resources into that argument. Um, and it may be connected with this other phenomenon that's happening that the sort of left is perceiving about the growth of um, the, the right, um, as in the right wing, that is using the First Amendment, particularly religious liberty as a trump, as the highest value. Um, so, you know, this has been in play for a while, but post Obergefell, the marriage equality case, um, the right has had a very well-funded, well-supported, you know, within conservative academia and religious organizations to say religious liberty trumps equality, that there should be religious exemptions from um, baseline anti-discrimination principles. Like I should not have to treat someone equally because I have faith in God. And the Supreme Court has tended to um, place that First Amendment value, this Supreme Court, um, I think you saw with some of the COVID um, dissents from, you know, critiquing um, uh, COVID related restrictions on churches, like the, the feeling of persecution and the idea that religion could trump a public health crisis. I, I think these, these two notions are connected that um, a fear that the right will use free speech and freedom of religion ultimately combined with money and power to um, take down equality norms. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there's um, a movement to um, undo through the constitution federal IRS restrictions on schools that racially discriminate. I think we could see that in 20, I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the Supreme Court says, said, um, no, the IRS is completely within its power to not give tax exempt status to Bob Jones University because the IRS regulations pr protecting against racial discrimination, which Bob Jones engaged in means Bob Jones shouldn't get the benefit and they, should, they don't get tax exempt status. I could see that being overturned in 25 years if the court continues to lurch in this incredibly conservative direction. Um, so, you know, I think this is a, this is a tough moment and to, and, but I think that's where the, the feeling of the threat is coming from. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, um, I think in regards to the, to camp, to the campaign money issue, that mm -hmm. they were using the concept of free speech in a in a democracy destroying way so yeah. that strikes me as something that's a big danger is when when there's a like all voices should be welcome but unless they're you know causing harm but if they're promoting anti-democracy or anti mm -hmm. if they're promoting like something that is anti-democratic that seems like a big threat yeah right um agreed um, so, so I think, I mean, that's, that is also, I think what's making its way into the left's concern about the first amendment, religion and free speech. It's sort of absolutist quality because like, if you read Justice Stevens dissent in Citizens United, it is all about the confluence of the first amendment and democracy, um, and the public square and democratic institutions not being drowned out by the distorting power of money that gives bigger speech, a bigger microphone to rich people. Um, and, and, then, and then, you know, the conservatives saying, no, First Amendment. Um, so I think, you know, um, we're in a space where we need to protect, you know, bona fide uh, dissent as a democracy enhancing vehicle but a little bit worried. And you and I have already talked about these distortions. They're sort of money, media, and cacophony um, that feel uh, a bit worrying um, and, and at the advantage of the powerful rather than the weak. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I mean, is there, do you have any recommendations for people who are fighting for social justice and for equality for how they might want to use free speech to their advantage and not let it be co-opted by the people they, they think are threatening those things? Absolutely. I mean, we, we do this all the time for sure. Um, representing, you know, representing activists, um, who are being threatened either by the government or frankly, these days, this goes to the, also the, you know, meta concern about conglomeration of corporate power, tons of activists that are being sued by massive environmental corporations, um, represent, represent a lot of protesters uh, who were fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline and were sued under some crazy civil RICO theories saying um, they were engaged in a conspiracy uh, to promote violence against the pipeline and their workers. It's all manufactured in the horseshit, but it's designed to make you think if you engage in organized protest against powerful corporate interests, we will come after you and where are you going to find a lawyer when you see a lawsuit that, you know, suing for $10 billion. And we'll, that, that's the, and, and one thing I've learned in this work is um, the right and the sort of wealthy corporate litigation bar is incredibly well coordinated and they are all seeing and coordinating these strategies. So we, um, and you can Google it on our website, we're in a coalition called Protect the Protest. That's all about providing resources, including litigation resources for those um, protesters, social justice protesters, animal activists, animal rights activists, environmental activists, racial justice activists, um, of course, protesters on the streets um, protesting systemic anti-Black violence in this country. Um, the way we are um, supporting the environmental justice movement is working with environmental justice activists, trying to strike down legislation that's designed to restrict their speech and freedom of protest and freedom of march. I think it can be an incredibly, I mean, I guess to take your point, um, just to do more of that work on behalf of progressive causes um, and activists um, and to um, leverage this incredibly powerful tool to you know, get their voices out there, which otherwise the state wants to repress, frankly, and corporations want to repress. I mean, the, the environmental regulations we're challenging in Louisiana were written by big oil. Um, designating pipelines a quote in critical infrastructure so that and critical infrastructure is normally conceived of as like a nuclear power plant or an electrical grid so that if you're on top of it it's a crime um, so that's written for oil and gas to shut down uh, protest over the, the the pipeline going through Louisiana um, so we're challenging that um, and um, and you know, big corporations are sort of uh, pushing legislation to um, criminalize animal rights activism. So we, you know, we've tried to challenge that. I think there's a really, really robust um, space um, to protect progressive movements because um, they're normally voiceless. They don't have access to the sort of mainstream media. Um, and so, and they're constantly under attack. So bringing our, our sort of voice and our leverage to support them is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the animal rights one is, I've always just been so mystified that animal rights activists will get on terrorist watch lists and you know, they're considered this huge threat. So their speech and their activism is, is deemed harmful. But, and you've been talking about that, those limits of what is harm? What is harmful speech? So, I mean, that's a huge question for me that I've been thinking about a lot. What constitutes harmful speech and how do we navigate that? Um, well, I think legally it's pretty clear that speech that is like incredibly critical of an organization or the government has to be protected. I mean, I think what corporations tried to get written in the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which labeled 
animal rights activism as terrorism and not just the physical destruction of property. There was vague provisions that would um, penalize activism designed to decrease profit. And we were like, wait, wait, wait a second. Does that mean if we march in front of uh, Monsanto and people are persuaded not to buy Monsanto products, we're engaged in terrorism? Um, so we sued on those grounds and basically it was kind of a success without victory. The, the court said, oh, the statute doesn't go that far. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's far narrower. So you are free to engage in that anything short of actual physical property damage. So um, all of those forms of protest should be uh, protected. And even, you know, I think this is part of the, the progressive legacy as well. Um, representing people in the criminal context who are arrested for free speech activity. Um, and so that's a form of resistance of state power. If uh, you get somebody bailed um, and you represent them in a, you know, in, a, in a criminal case and you assert First Amendment defenses, that limits the ability of the state to just go into any protest any time and round people up. And then suing after the fact for money damages um, for illegal uh, protest activities, sorry, illegal anti-protest activities by police. I think there's um, an enormous space for uh, progressives to support activism um, and youth activism and, and immigrant rights activism um, and, and civil disobedience as well. Mm -hmm. So is that something that's being used against like BLM protesters or how is that playing out? Yeah, I think we've been mindful. We were keeping an eye out um, for uh, the use of the kind of terrorism label against BLM protesters. Uh, and there were a handful of cases. And happily, there were fewer federal prosecutions than we kind of expected there would be. Uh, they tended to be in places where you might expect them to be, like, you know, uh, Missouri and um, other more conservative jurisdictions. Um, but, you know, the explosion of protest activity this summer, with some exceptions around horrific police responses and violence, including in New York, um, is like the, the most, I think, profound vision of the First Amendment. Um, legally protecting and preventing any state interference with the right of people to mobilize collectively and demand, shout, march, insist on change. And it happened. It shifted public opinion through that mass mobilization. Um, so, you know, we've sort of come full circle to what a really beautiful vision of the First Amendment can be on behalf of social justice movements who um, embrace their rights to move collectively, speak collectively, march collectively, um, and demand recognition and change from the government and from their fellow citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Yeah, I was just listening to this interview with Ira Glasser, who formerly head of the ACLU, and uh -huh. He was talking about how every group that's had to start as to, uh, in advocating for their rights, whether it was black people in this country or women or whoever it may have been, LGBT, that they started from a position of you know unpopularity and being marginalized. So they had to sort of start with that principle that we should be allowed a voice and not mm -hmm. shut down. So he was you know making the argument that uh, these movements today could also greatly benefit from returning to those principles. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And um, I'm thinking about two movements, the anti-apartheid movement in the 1980s that was all about um, free speech and political activism. And um, another place area which we're really involved in, if you want to talk about progressive social movements, the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Um, there have been laws supported by, you know, Congress and wealthy interests, uh, including interest in Israel and in the United States, to uh, criminalize protest and boycott in support of Palestinian human rights in virtually every state. And the First Amendment has been used to strike down those state laws. Uh, and should the federal law pass, 
strike down those laws as well. It's, it's the, you know, it's, again, the vision we talked about, the state, um, if it wants the status quo, knows the way to get it is to shut down what it perceived all of a sudden was the biggest threat, which is political momentum in the form of protests on behalf of Palestinian human rights. That's the threat. It's working. So given that they cannot, um, and it's cowardly, um, it's cowardly. That's also the way Brandeis used to talk about the First Amendment. It's, it's not for cowards. It's cowardly to suppress speech. It's, it's, it's um, cowardly in the way that a powerful coward acts. Um, I can't face you um, with the, any moral clarity in my arguments. I'm going to, even though I'm an incredibly you know, wealthy and militarized state, I'm going to claim that your speech criticizing my internationally condemned human rights policies um, uh, threatened me and that I'm somehow ill-equipped with all the power I have in this world to counter that speech and debate you. So I'm going to use my resources to con and, and, and distort and lie um, to get state legislators to shut you up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's, I mean, I keep seeing this popping up from different people on different sides of the political spectrum, but this desire to deplatform rather than engage in arguments. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, can you talk more about, by the way, for, you know, who is Brandeis and what's, what's his importance? Oh, sorry. Here? Louis Brandeis um, was uh, a justice of the Supreme Court um, from, you know, 1915 to maybe the 30s, um, an avowedly progressive voice. Um, and I think the first Jew on the Supreme Court um, who, uh, along with Oliver Wendell Holmes, was in this process that I talked about of largely inventing the First Amendment by reacting to these repressive laws and thinking through uh, what the values of the First Amendment are. And in one of his really powerful opinions, he he says basically suppression of speech is, is a cowardly act. Um, mm. So, um, and I think that's, um, that resonates with me because protests like in the streets and on behalf of Palestinian human rights and against majority public opinion, that's a heroic act. And it's cowardly to meet that heroism with just pure power and influence. Yeah, that's a powerful quote. And um, yeah. that reminds me of another thing that Ira Glasser was talking about, because he, he did mention, the, and I'm forgetting which university it was, I think it was in England, but that there was a, a Zionist student group, and they supported at one point a hate crime, a, a hate speech policy that would mean that their opponents could not speak. But then a few years later, the political winds changed, and it was used against them, because Zionism was then considered um, a mm -hmm. form of racism. That was what he said. So that's so in terms of that uh, element of it the strategy of of no. allowing speech of people you disagree with how does that is that a, do you see that as an effective strategy oh i think we all we are very careful about about that about knowing that um changing the law around the right to protest and the right to speak could hurt our people um even as you know, we're critical of um, uh, right-wing and racist speech, um, you know, embedding legal principles, trying to create exceptions. I think we are very concerned would be dangerous for our people, um, given how power works. Um, so, um, you know, I think, um, uh, yeah, there can be, you know, critiques and, and thinking about how um, all of the distortions we're talking about, which I think is the place of anxiety um, that, that we mentioned. Um, but in theory, in theory, setting aside money and power, um, a neutral First Amendment would help our people more mm -hmm. than it would hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that that's um understood among i mean there's this maybe there's this generational gap where you know 
my generation is is really intrigued by the argument that free speech is being used by the powerful and being used in uh, support of racism and and all those things. Right. Do you see that as a generational thing? It might be. It really might be. I think there's you know probably this the younger generation sees the politics of the First Amendment being associated with like um, white left anti-war absolutism um, and that that's not the thing now um, and um, you know these white men who are advocating for free speech don't understand the current controversies we face so um, I take your point there might be and you know and you know I think there are ways in which that narrative can really hold and not ha have nuance I think you're you're, you might be right, and you would know better than me. Uh, maybe some in the younger generation don't appreciate the way in which uh, speech is important to marginalized community um, mm -hmm. and how repression of speech in the way you just talked about will, will be used against um, uh, progressive voices seeking social change because social change seeks to change power dynamics and power might respond without a legal protection through silencing them. Um, and so that, um, you might be right. It might be a shift in values and also might be um, uh, a kind of narrative that's taken hold that the First Amendment couldn't accommodate progressive values as much as we'd like. Um, and um, that's a conversation worth having um, so that people, go into the debate about the First Amendment, mindful about its, its pretty considerable power to protect um, progressive causes. Yeah, that's something that I'm hoping to um, promote with my mm -hmm. podcast because Great. I, from what I'm learning about free speech as I'm, as I'm learning more and more, it does have that power. It's the, it's the, key thing for groups who don't have a voice um but of course it has that flip side of the danger of it being used against the powerless and to take away their voice or to cause them harm but it is really hard to weigh those things and um yeah like wh where do you see this going where do you see those those things uh that that scale sort of balancing out or how where is this going in the near future um yeah, I'm not, it's hard to say. I mean, I think um, I'm definitely worried about sort of the um, exaltation of religious liberty as being an answer to um, every response to every government regulation in the way that in the you know 1920s, commercial liberty and freedom of contract was a way to strike down pro progressive social legislation. Um, but that's religion. Um, and that's being like elevated because they're losing in progressive social space. So they need a right and the right um, can be religion. Um, I think, and, and I don't think the first amendment, you know, uh, can be used in exactly the same way as religion. Um, it, you know, although unless we're not careful, um, I believe, and this is, you know, I believe that the conservative legal movement the right is deeply cynical and has an authoritarian cast um, and would um, and is um, couches the sort of anti equality norms around like liberty. Um, so they would, of course, you know, they've in the 60s, they didn't talk about I have a right to be racist. They talked about civil rights impedes my freedom. Um, so I think um, we have to be able to protect the core values of the First Amendment while rejecting that, I would say, democracy distorting ways in which the First Amendment can be used to harm people and harm democracy. And I think not having equality harms democracy. Um, support, you know, um, uh, kind of free, and, and yeah, um, I don't want to talk about, the, we need to be mindful of um, using the First Amendment to protect democracy. And that could be just a fight in the courts and in the streets because the other side is going to use the First Amendment 
to harm democracy, as we've seen the past four years. Hmm. Well, I feel like that's a really good note to end on. And you've given us so much to think about. So thank you, Bahar. My pleasure, Sasha. It was a really, really thoughtful conversation. I enjoyed it. Great. Thank you so much.